Welcome to the third and fourth episodes of the Diplomacy Light podcast. These two episodes are about one of the most important disarmament or arms control legal documents. The Biological and Toxins Weapons Convention, the BTWC, or more commonly known as the BWC, effectively prohibits biological and toxin weapons, building on the Geneva Protocol of 1925. The BWC was opened for signature on 10th of April 1972 in all three depository states simultaneously, the United States, the United Kingdom and the Soviet Union, of which the Russian Federation is a successor state, and then entered into force on 26th of March 1975. The BWC is the first treaty to ban a whole category of weapons, and in this case a weapon of mass destruction. Though quite short, the convention has served for half a century in prohibiting the development, production, stockpiling, acquisition, and use of the most horrendous type of warfare, the one using the life sciences to negate life. Our three guests not only come from the three depository states, but also have been critical actors in different stages of the development of this important treaty and norm. It is an impossible task to do justice in introducing these three highly distinguished gentlemen. So it is best to keep it very brief and put links in the description below for anyone who wishes to find more about them. If one types into a search engine today, the most beautiful experiment, without even specifying the science, in this case biology, Dr. Messelson's name comes immediately as the result. The beauty was in the elegant simplicity of the experiment that Dr. Messelson and Dr. Frank Stahl designed to confirm the DNA replicates by the double helix structure, as Watson and Creek had predicted. Dr. Messelson also solved the Sverdlovsk anthrax mystery and was decisive in the ending of the use of Agent Orange in Vietnam. And if there is one person who can be said to be the critical force in the world now having a biological and toxin weapons, weapons convention, it is he. Dr. John Walker was head of the Arms Control and Disarmament Research Unit of the UK's Foreign and Commonwealth Office until May 2020, when he retired. There is a handful of people in the world who have been as involved at a high level over the past three decades in the work of the biological, chemical and nuclear arms control as Dr. Walker. Ambassador Sergei Batsanov, who was the permanent representative of the USSR and then of the Russian Federation to the Conference on Disarmament from 1989 to 1993. After his work in helping negotiate the Chemical Weapons Convention, he then worked as director for special projects at the OPCW. Since 2005 to the present, Ambassador Batsanov has been the director of the Geneva office of the Pugwash Conferences on Science and World Affairs. It is truly a great honor to have these three distinguished gentlemen on the Diplomacy Light podcast. Diplomacy Light podcast. Light. Well, uh, to all the viewers and uh, listeners to the Diplomacy Light podcast, uh, we have a very special one uh, today. We have three highly esteemed uh, guests today on the Diplomacy Light podcast to discuss uh, something that is of extreme importance, but uh, for most uh, people, even in the disarmament and arms control um, uh, communities, uh, unfortunately has become somewhat of, of an afterthought, perhaps because of its effectiveness, perhaps because 50 years uh, of its existence, uh, it has proven its, its worth. Uh, in the language of the convention itself, uh, there is uh, the, the phrase which draws from the 1925 Geneva Protocol that the use of biological we weapons is morally repugnant, and that's certainly the case. But I think that what is more important today to remind ourselves of its importance is to think of it through the military and diplomatic uh, aspects, because these are the aspects that co had convinced um, your uh, policy makers and decision makers, rather, uh, in each of the, the capitals of, uh, of Washington, of London, of uh, Moscow, uh, and then uh, the rest of the world, convinced them that these are the types of weapons that should be fully banned, first of any type of weapon and first of weapons of mass destruction, certainly. 
So if I may start, uh, Matthew, with, with you, um, you have shared uh, on, on several occasions the, the process of, of um, convincing Kissinger and then Nixon at that time uh, to self-restraint. Uh, we would still be quite curious to hear about this because this is the logic perhaps that we, reminding, we need reminding of today. Matthew, if you would, please. Well, the logic that worked in this particular case is that no head of a large state which has already weapons, strategic weapons of mass destruction could possibly want to introduce into the world very cheap weapons, strategic weapons of mass destruction. To put it bluntly, what world leader of a big country could possibly want to introduce into the world a 10 cent hydrogen bomb? So when I first realized this, which was brought home to me when I was given a tour at Fort Detrick by a very nice gentleman who showed me a large building, a seven-story building, and I asked, what do we do here? He said, we have a 10,000-gallon fermenter and we make anthrax spores. I asked, why do we do that? And he said, because it will save us money. It's much cheaper than nuclear weapons. And it dawned on me then that I was now in possession of an unbeatable argument. There's no argument against arms control on biological weapons if you are a big state. The only problem is getting the question on the desk of the leaders of the big countries. And to do that, you need to do several different things. You need to have public opinion behind you. You need to have, if there is a legislative body that deals with international conventions, which in our case is the Senate, you need to have some senators. You need to have the advisors of the head of state. But in the end, there's only one person in the United States who could stop that program, which we did have at that time. That would be the president. I had no way of directly contacting the president, but by marvelous good luck, I was a friend of Henry Kissinger before he took office, before President Nixon uh, became president. And so when he did become the national security advisor, he asked me what I thought we should do about what he called my thing, which was biological weapons. And uh, from then on, I think it was just a matter of communication. So now we still lack, however, a verification protocol. And later in this session this morning, I want to talk about that because I think I know why we failed and how it could be done differently and successfully. Thank you. Uh, we certainly will. This is one of uh, uh, the milestones in the development of global biosecurity. Um, uh, but before that, uh, John, if I may um, come to you with, with uh, to ask you, because during this time, while well, well, this was happening in, in Washington and Boston, um, uh, Cambridge, Massachusetts, uh, what was the thinking in London, uh, it, specifically around biological weapons? Um, it, it, at that time, the thinking was to really make an effort uh, to go for both biological and chemical, uh, but the decision was made to focus strictly on, on, on biological. If you could share uh, the, the thinking at that time from the perspective of London. Yeah, sure. I mean, the, the essential was that back in the 1950s, the UK decided in 1956 to get out of the offensive chemical warfare uh, <laughs> game, primarily because it was too expensive. And by default, the offensive biological weapons program basically faded away uh, by the end of the 1950s. And if we move forward to 1968 with the conclusion of the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty, which was a major objective of UK arms control and disarmament policy, um, officials and ministers in London started to think about, well, what do we do next? That was a major achievement securing the MPT. What else can we do that's important and valuable in arms control? And there's a major study done in the Foreign Office in 1968 to looking at various options. Uh, the two principal ones were to do something on a comprehensive nuclear test ban treaty. But the other one was to do something on CBW uh, arms control. Um, 
chemicals were difficult at that time for two main reasons. One was the ongoing controversies over the use of CS gas uh, by US uh, forces in the Vietnam War. And it was felt that that made it a rather sensitive issue to focus on. And secondly, chemical warfare was also seen much more uh, embodied in state stockpiles and arsenals, and they had doctrines to go with them. So that suggested maybe something that could be done on biological weapons um, to reinforce the 1925 Geneva Protocol. So the essential conclusion, therefore, was that the UK should seek to do something on biological weapons. There were certain sensitivities uh, that the US might not entirely welcome at that point, any kind of initiative on CB arms control. Um, Fred Mulley, who was the Minister of State for Disarmament in the Foreign Office, went to Washington to talk to the US about what might be done in this area. And at that particular point, um, 1968, the advice from the US was, well, we don't mind too much, but we'd rather not have any kind of treaties at this particular time. So the UK went back and um, drafted a working paper, which was tabled in the 18 Nation Disarmament Committee in the summer of um, 68. It laid out how a biological weapons um, convention might be constructed and what the issues would be at stake. Um, so that was essentially you know, how it came about from the UK uh, end. Uh, we'd taken the initiative, um, and then in the following year, in 1969, uh, a draft treaty was in fact tabled uh, in Geneva, which didn't go down entirely well at that particular time with the non-aligned countries in the 18 Nation Disarmament Committee, or indeed uh, the Soviet Union and its allies in the Warsaw Pact. But we'll probably come to that uh, a bit later in our conversations. But in short, uh, it was the UK decision to have an initiative on biological weapons um, following the MPT. Thanks, John. Uh, Sergey, if I may turn to you, uh, in, in at that time, basically uh, going forward from 1925, the Geneva Protocols, the use of chemical and biological weapons was already uh, made illegal, uh, but not all the other aspects that were then covered. Uh, from what I've uh, understood, the, the thinking in, in the beginning um, in, in Moscow was that uh, chemical and biological should not be separated, that if an effort is to be made, then the effort should be for, for both. Could you please share the, the, the thinking in, in, in Moscow and in the, in the Warsaw Pact uh, at that time? Look, uh, compared to the two previous speakers, I have to confess that I was not around in those days meaning around, um, well, working uh, on arms control, disarmament. So uh, my, uh, my uh, impressions come from, uh, well, reading certain papers and talking to people, uh, but it, it all happened later when I entered the service, uh, the diplomatic service of the Soviet Union. Uh, now, several, uh, several elements, I think, can be uh, noted here. Uh, one is uh, probably not unlike in the United States, uh, was the fact that, of course, most attention, importance, uh, let's say, recognition, glory, and influence uh, in the Soviet uh, armed forces, uh, of course, belonged uh, to strategic forces uh, of the Soviet Union, nuclear forces. Uh, and that, uh, in a way, was making it, uh, of course, more difficult uh, in those days and later uh, to find uh, interagency agreements about details of negotiations, agreements, and so on and so forth, and uh, somehow uh, easier, provided there was, uh, let's say, favorable political uh, background or atmosphere to address issues relating to chemical and biological weapons. Now, it is a broad statement. Uh, there are very important nuances here, but uh, Many people, or most people, uh, at higher political levels preferred to know something or pretend to know something about strategic nuclear forces and knew very little and were not ashamed of that uh, about uh, chemical and biological weapons. Now, as an issue, uh, the prohibition of chemical and biological weapons was 
kind of something legitimate uh, as it came from, uh, well, uh, these two categories were put uh, into the category of weapons of mass destruction in the UN, uh, then uh, in the late 40s, then uh, in uh, 1950s, when uh, especially uh, the USSR and the US were exchanging uh, various proposals about uh, comprehensive disarmament, general and complete disarmament. Prohibition of chemical and biological weapons was also always and already there. Uh, so as, a, as an issue, it was not uh, an irritant uh, in, a, in a political sense. Uh, then, uh, yes, but uh, in all those proposals that I have seen, prohibition of chemical weapons and biological weapons uh, just came in one line somewhere in phase, at the end of phase two or in phase three or, uh, or similar. Uh, so there was little practical discussion about it. Then, Thank you. Sorry. Uh, yeah, uh, and then came uh, 1960s, uh, the idea of transition from those general comprehensive schemes to practical steps, the, um, well, let's say par uh, partial test ban treaty was uh, the first example, then NPT the second, uh, and also the question arose, what next? And it was uh, kind of not so difficult to put forward the prohibition of chemical and biological weapons politically, uh, especially in the wake of the Vietnam War. Uh, and not it was kind of appeared to be an attractive uh, proposition, propagandistically, uh, so to speak. Uh, but not only because of the use of CS, but also because of large deforestation uh, programs uh, conducted by the US in Vietnam and other countries of the region. Plus what played a role, uh, and it was probably a rare occasion when such uh, documents played a role, uh, the WHO study about consequences of, of use of chemical and biological weapons. Uh, so there came a proposal to, uh, for a treaty or convention banning chemical and biological weapons. Uh, Thank you. Uh, which, was, which was submitted by the Soviet Union together with its allies uh, or in, in the Warsaw Pact. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Matthew, uh, controllability is an aspect. Obviously, uh, expense cost is one aspect that, it, that, that, that have proved to be decisive, but also the ability to control a biological weapon. Uh, militaries want uh, to be able to control. Command and control is one of the key aspects uh, with, a, with a military. Um, uh, can you share a little bit uh, on the, the, this aspect of controllability as a factor? Um, and then, if you, if you could, um, I think, uh, share on how biology itself um, was um, resisted with your help, considerable help, to be weaponized. Was it this? Was it this aspect of controllability that was the argument to, to do it? Um, and, and, and at that time, it was uh, first biology as a science that protected itself, but then uh, others kind of came up. Uh, play, if you could please share the, the, the thinking at that time from, from your I'll try to do that, but before I do that, I want to talk about a different kind of sets of causality that influence whether or not one gets an agreement and what kind of agreement. So I became interested in this subject totally by accident. One summer when I had nothing much to do, I was asked to come to the United States Arms Control and Disarmament Agency to do work there. They didn't know exactly what they wanted me to do, but they said, why don't you work on European theater nuclear arms control? Something about which I knew nothing. That was all right because I thought maybe I could learn about it, but the trouble was that other people had already thought a lot about it. 
So it was pretty clear to me I couldn't contribute much. So since I am a chemist and a biologist, I asked my boss, Franklin Long was his name, if I could do something in the area of chemical and biological weapons. He said, sure, do whatever you want. We're going off to Moscow to negotiate the atmospheric test ban. And so I began to read, and they had a man who had worked on this before, but he was no longer there. I read the materials he had accumulated. I went to the CIA to see what we thought other countries were doing. And the answer to that was, we had suspicions, but no certain knowledge. And I went to Fort Dietrich, as I mentioned, and that's what really got me going. The realization that here was an absolutely unbeatable argument. You just had to get it on the desk of the President of the United States. Now, what else was happening? So while I was at the Arms Control Agency, I wrote a paper which I foolishly classified top secret because it had an annex about stockpiles. But the title was something like uh, Agreement for the Abolition of Biological Weapons. And that later became, in an unclassified form, a pugwash paper. Now in England, and John can correct me if I'm wrong, but the point I'm trying to make here is that from unexpected and quite low levels in a government, or maybe even outside of a government, it's important what kinds of thinking is going on. Because at the level of the principles, they often don't have time to come up with novel ideas. So I, my understanding is that in England, what Patrick Mully brought to the CD when it was necessary for him to bring something to the CD was something that was already in the files that had been written by a gentleman named Derek Viney, who ended up teaching Latin in a boys' school. But the existence of thought before the question came before principles, before high-ranking government officials. Now, the next step is to get it to the attention of high-ranking officials. I don't know what caused Patrick Mully to need to bring something to the CD on that particular occasion, but on this side I do know, I believe I know, what caused this subject to go up from the level that no senior official would ever have seen, an obscure paper by an obscure ac academic working only part-time in the government. And that was a request from the German Minister of Defense for release authority for the chemical weapons that were stockpiled in Germany, having been moved out of France. This was a bombshell. Release authority for nuclear weapons and chemical weapons at that time was the same uh, procedure, namely the President of the United States. So in effect, if we were to agree to having the Bundestag have release authority, that is a uh, decision to use them on, on their own uh, 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 on their own, that would uh, have serious implications for nuclear weapons. And of course the idea at that time, poison gas and the history of Germany uh, was bad public relations too. So this meant that the most senior individuals in the United States government for the first time had to think seriously about chemical weapons and sort of piggyback on that question, biological weapons. Mr. Foster, who was the head of the Arms Control Agency, asked Mac Bundy, who was the President's National Security Advisor, to deal with this question at the level of the NSC. Bundy said, no, we're too busy. So it fell uh, to the Arms Control Agency at least to assemble the principles. And we, what happened at that point was that the Secretary of Defense, of course, asked the Army Chief of Staff what he would recommend, since chemicals were in the domain of the Army, and the Army Chief of Staff, I imagine, would have asked the chemical uh, general in charge of the Chemical Corps, who probably would have said, let's not do this. In other words, there still wasn't much real interest in getting this done. Now, later we could talk about what finally got it over the top, but my point is that it's, first of all, important to have thinking done long in advance of an actual measure. And that usually will happen at a very low level. But a paper in the somewhere in the government where something has been thought out, even if only roughly, that's a very good idea. So if there's something you want to achieve and it looks almost hopeless, nevertheless, write it up, 
so that it's there when the time comes, if it comes, for actual implementation. And the next thing is, you need something to knock the particular idea up to the level of principal officers of the government. So those two steps are essential. Now, you're asking about uh, considerations that have to do with the reality of those particular weapons. I would say that's very important, but you must keep in mind that these other issues, personalities, accidents of whether a document exists in a safe somewhere, uh, political activities like what the German Minister of Defense asked for, and these things, these atmospheric things <coughs> are very important. Now, on the level of the actual value, for example, of biological weapons, well, the nuclear powers, who are the principal ones in these negotiations, uh, of course, would consider biological weapons as a terrible menace, but they would rather that the world not have any because they already had nuclear and thermonuclear weapons. So you've got a very strong motivation on the part of the large countries. And so, yes, there was some maybe detailed analysis of battlefield utility and all that, but I don't think that had much influence because, and even this question of morality, I think the big issue was the fact that big countries would not want ultra cheap weapons that could destabilize the international scene. There was a lot of argumentation about the norm and about uh, history and previous agreements going all the way back to St. Petersburg Agreement. This was mainly amongst academics. Uh, very interesting. I'm not sure because I wasn't at the level of the, of the National Security Advisor. I doubt that those things were thought about. The papers I tried to write for President Nixon, who I never met, but were transmitted via Henry Kissinger, I tried to imagine that I was the president. What do I need to know? What are my concerns? And those concerns mainly, well, I don't want to go on too long, so I'll stop right here. But there's a big no, difference between the academic world and the government level. No, thank you. And, and there's the uh, a very interesting episode of how then toxins were added to it as well. Um, uh, the, the UK draft uh, didn't include them. And then um, uh, is it, I, I guess Kissinger was asked by a journalist, and what about toxins? And uh, neither Kissinger uh, nor the journalist, as you have pointed out uh, in another lecture, knew anything about, uh, uh, about this. And a, a renewed thinking about whether to include toxins was, was also included. The British viewed them as chemicals, and we had three possible options, and the president had to decide amongst them. The Joint Chiefs wanted to retain the right to use toxins, whether they were made by bacteria or other living organisms, or by chemists. The Secretary of Defense, Mel Laird, uh, favored the middle option, which was we reserve the right to use toxins if made by chemists, not if they're made by living things, and you can see why because made by living things verges very close to biological warfare. The Secretary of State uh, and uh, USIA both wanted to, re to forswear toxins under all circumstances. So Henry Kissinger and the President went to Key Biscayne uh, for a kind of rest, work rest session, and one of the things they were going to do was to decide amongst these three options. Henry recommended the middle option, uh, I don't know if that's what he argued in private. I only know that that's what was on paper. I had prepared a paper called What Policy for Toxins? I'd given it to Henry. Uh, one night when I and my wife were out for dinner, Henry called me. I wasn't home. They couldn't find my paper. He was calling to ask if I had a copy. He couldn't reach me. So then he called Paul Doty, a good friend here, asked Paul if he had the paper. Paul looked for it, he couldn't find it either. Later that night, at about 11 o'clock, I'm still out to dinner, Henry called Paul and said, we found the paper, the president has decided on option three, complete renunciation of toxins, and what made up his mind, and this is my point here, I wrote a paper which I thought would be appropriate coming from a scientist, namely what 
role could toxins play? A uh, toxin warhead uh, would still have to be carried by a big artillery shell. So in many ways, you're not saving. It's a separate logistic burden, all kinds of stuff like that. Toxins don't penetrate the skin. And then I had seen something in the Washington Post that caught my eye, written by Steve, uh, Steve somebody there. And it was this, on this issue. How can the president renounce typhoid only to embrace botulism? And I thought that sounded pretty good, but how could I put that in a paper by somebody who's supposed to be more of a scientific and sort of amateur military advisor? This is politics. That's, I have no business. So I thought I could do it this way. I put into my paper a section called The Authority and Credibility of the President. Well, according to Paul, Henry said that's what changed the president. That's what decided the president to go for option three. And of course, it makes sense. What does the president care about more than his authority and credibility? So there, too, you can see it wasn't a technical argument. It was something quite different. In that case, we really know what made the mind of the president. In this case, President Nixon, of course. That's why the United States decided to renounce toxins. Thank you. Sergei, you were not, uh, uh, as you said yourself, uh, around for the negotiation of the Biological Weapons Convention, but you were for the Chemical Weapons Convention. Uh, if I may, it's... it's uh, when when thinking about the, again the two two sciences here biology and, and chemistry early on biology kind of as I said protected itself from being weaponized um, and really was the first one uh, to develop uh, a legal regime um, complex uh, around biological weapons but then it was chemical weapons that actually took the fore in terms of really developing a full regime with the OPCW and uh, everything what was it about uh, was it the time was it um, the science itself what was it that made it possible in the 90s to negotiate the Chemical Weapons Convention and the OPCW as its supporting cast? Uh, well, I think that most of the important negotiations on the CWC took place in the second half of the 1980s, not in the 90s, actually. Uh, in the 90s, it was the conclusion of the talks in Geneva and, of course, a lot of work to build the uh, OPCW. Uh, what happened was, uh, I think, a combination of several factors. Uh, one was that um, we and the Americans uh, somehow uh, moved uh, in obviously uncoordinated steps in terms of building up or modernizing chemical arsenals. Americans would stop, we would begin. They, uh, we would probably complete uh, a program, they would start, uh, which was, of course, not uh, helpful in any case. But what um, uh, happened in early 1980s uh, or in, by mid-1980s, we had, of course, um, uh, a rapid deterioration of uh, security uh, situation in Europe with the deployment of the new uh, nuclear weapons, um, and that was later resolved through the INF Treaty. Uh, we had uh, difficulties uh, in the United States about uh, really procuring in, uh, uh, the new generation of uh, chemical weapons. We had, uh, in my view, quite exaggerated fears in the Soviet Union about uh, the binary uh, American chemical weapons. Uh, and we had Gorbachev uh, with the new thinking and uh, the idea to uh, change the image of the country into something open, progressive, 
result oriented in the area of disarmament. And that opened actually quite some opportunities. Uh, but uh, I think that in terms of uh, uh, in terms of really pushing uh, the situation forward, uh, a very important uh, step was made by the United States um, in the Conference on Disarmament, and that is when um, they submitted the famous document CD500, I still remember the number, which was almost a complete draft of the Chemical Weapons Convention, which included, and I would say rather dutifully and correctly, uh, all the good results achieved uh, at bilateral consultations uh, between Moscow and Washington, which had been taking place since mid-1970s uh, uh, and uh, late 1970s, but also um, added uh, several uh, additions, especially in the area of verification, um, which were difficult for uh, the Soviet Union to digest, but uh, which we finally uh, did accept, not exactly as they were proposed, obviously, uh, but in uh, certain respects going even further. Uh, I remember, and I was around at that time, uh, Gorbachev wanted to issue a comprehensive statement, which uh, then came out in January, I think, 1986, on arms control and disarmament. Um, most battles were about nuclear, and I was given a task to write a couple of paragraphs on chemical weapons. To my great surprise, uh, what I wrote uh, actually ended up without any significant change uh, in Gorbachev's statement. Uh, and my purpose was just in very general form to uh, resolve uh, all the problems we, the Soviet Union, were having with the positions of other countries. It uh, contained the uh, recognition that we have new, uh, chemical weapons, something we were refusing to do earlier, uh, that we have uh, production of chemical weapons, that we were ready to not only to stop productions, but to stop production, but uh, to dismantle production facilities. Uh, that uh, we could accept uh, a very uh, syst uh, serious systematic verification, and all those uh, basic things. The only exception at that time was uh, challenge inspection. Frankly, I thought that it would have been too much. Uh, we did it about, uh, well, several months later. Uh, but otherwise, that statement uh, actually untied our hands or the hands of uh, our diplomacy in Geneva to a great extent. And we started to feel ourselves, uh, you know, very happy and see how others were having difficulties with uh, that or another provision of uh, or issue uh, at the negotiation table. Uh, so, well, that's how it happened. Uh, now, I have to say that in many meetings um, later on, uh, and not only on chemical weapons, uh, I've been discussing uh, that statement with uh, various American colleagues, and. Uh, well, at least uh, a good part of them uh, conceded or acknowledged that at the time of the uh, of issuing that statement, uh, the predominant view in the U.S. was that it was all propaganda, but it wasn't. Neither on chemical weapons nor on other things, uh, including nuclear, uh, and that's why. Um, Gorbachev's proposals uh, 
in Reykjavik, uh, which took place about half a year after that statement, uh, was also uh, a surprise to the US. Yeah, thank you. John, uh, uh, surprise, uh, challenge inspections rather uh, are somewhat of a pipe dream in the Biological Weapons Convention um, uh, or any kind of verification. If we can uh, open up uh, this the million dollar uh, issue uh, or ruble or, or pound uh, of, of verification. Uh, you have written in, in several occasions and you were a part of, uh, of uh, and you have been a part for the past um, a couple of a few decades uh, on trying to find uh, some kind of a compliance measure around the Biological Weapons Convention. You believe that the complexities are still insurmountable and could you perhaps take us through that time of, of, of thinking of the ad hoc group, the Verix uh, discussions? Yeah, I mean, like everything in this area underwent a sort of long evolution. Um, I'm picking up what both Matthew and Sergei have said, that when the Biological Toxin Weapons Convention was concluded, one of its articles said, get on with getting a chemical weapons convention negotiation. Um, and there were bilateral negotiations between the US and USA between 76 and 1980. Sergey mentioned the draft treaty. Now, whilst all that was going on, the Biological and Toxin Weapons Convention was sitting somewhat in the shade. And people started to make connections that if we can achieve these sorts of things in the chemical sphere, why not also in the biological sphere? And there were talks or proposals, particularly from the USSR, that maybe we should talk about verification in the BTWC. But until that point, you no, know, really kind of mid to late 80s, the general perception was that the convention was unverifiable. I mean, that had been a principle way back in 68 and 69. Uh, but what I think they really meant was that at that particular time, countries, particularly, of course, the Soviet Union and its allies, would not accept on-site inspection. And as an absolute minimum for any biological uh, verification regime, you would need to have fairly intrusive on-site activities. And if countries couldn't accept that, then there was no point even discussing it. Um, the big transformations were the emergence of the CWC and the changes in the Soviet position, where... Uh, they strongly supported verification. And of course, one of the great ironies which Sergei was alluding to is that the Soviet Union could accept challenge inspection uh, as originally conceived anywhere, anytime, but the US couldn't, um, mm. which, and, which made all kinds of uh, issues in the negotiations, which delayed them for some time. So all that was kind of converging into the 90s. And as the Cold War was ending, um, that also improved prospects. And the key point really came in 91 at the third review conference when there was agreement to, to look into verification. The CWC was getting close to conclusion. Uh, we'd seen the end of the Iran-Iraq war. Uh, we had UNSCOM getting underway in Iraq as well. So all these things came together. So the minimum we got was let's look at verification. What are the possibilities? What could, couldn't be done? And that led to the uh, establishment of a verification expert group, otherwise known as VERIX, uh, which met from 92 to 93 to look at the, basically the pros and cons, what off-site measures might work, what on-site measures might work, how might they work in combination. Um, and this produced a various, uh, very carefully drafted conclusion from the special, which led to a special conference to decide what to do next, that yes, you could do something useful in verification. Um, now, the special conference convened in September um, 94, yeah, 94, I think it would have been, uh, to see what could be agreed. And that was a carefully crafted and hard fought compromise that set up what became the ad hoc group. Uh, There's a lot of argument about what to call this thing, and the ad hoc group was the line of least resistance. And whilst Western countries were really only interested in talking about verification, the only way to get agreement that we could actually talk about this and negotiate something uh, was we had to include other things as well. Uh, from the Soviet Union's point of view, we had to focus on a list of agents and threshold quantities, um, which we didn't particularly like for a variety of reasons, particularly technical. Uh, Non-aligned countries wanted to talk about Article 10, cooperation and assistance. And I can't remember who was particularly fast, but we also had to talk about CBM. So there were four main areas, compliance, CBMs, cooperation and assistance, and threshold quantities list of agents. 
Um, so that was a starting point that led to the ad hoc group that got underway in January 95, a short admin meeting. The first substantive meeting was July uh, 95. And it was quickly apparent that while states paid a lot of lip service to the desirability of verification, they weren't in fact prepared to agree the kinds of measures that would be required to produce anything that would be useful. Um, there were endless arguments over the scope of declarations, what kind of facilities and activities ought to be declared. Um, people wanted to narrow the scope of those declarations, what kind of information ought to be provided. Uh, again, arguments about that. And sometimes I had the sense that even by asking for the time of day was regarded as a bit of an impertinence by, by many. And this wasn't just um, uh, an East-West issue. It was countries within the Western group, certainly in the non-aligned uh, who had problems with all of these issues. Um, and what came to on-site measures, um, many states opposed any kind of routine activity that, of the sorts of things we'd had in the Chemical Weapons Convention. Uh, and in many ways, that strict read across wasn't appropriate because you can't really measure and count things in the biological area. Uh, certainly when it came to challenge inspection type activities, um, that was highly contentious, particularly since it would need to have something to look into infectious outbreaks of disease, which was very difficult, allegations of use, as well as suspect facilities. All of this was highly contested um, by a broad range of countries. Um, the US had problems with many aspects of this. So did the Russians, the Chinese, the Indians, the Iranians. Um, Germans and the Japanese didn't particularly care for any kind of detailed work in industry. So we had massive problems trying to get anything that would command consensus um, and importantly, which would actually be useful and we're making meaningful contribution to containing the threat posed by biological weapons. So whilst we had the ending of the Cold War, which opened things up a good deal, we had the end of the Gulf War, we had UNSCOM's experience, which was particularly influential in showing what could be done in the biological sphere. None of that was sufficient to overcome the major technical challenges, um, which might have been resolvable had there been a broad level of political will from all countries to, to get this. Um, and frankly, that, that didn't exist. My personal feeling was at the time that there were really only two countries that were desperately keen to secure the conclusion of such a, a protocol. That was the UK and that was South Africa. And that was one of the main reasons, I think, why Tibor Toth, the chairman, invited me and Ben Stein from South Africa to assist him in the development of his chairman's text. We were later described as editorial facilitators, where the task was to work out how do we square all these very difficult circles? Um, we did our best. Um, some states would have got some things they would have lost in others. And the hope was, as it had been with the Chemical Weapons Convention when it was been tabled by the German ambassador, that um, this would be enough for everybody. They could hold their noses at some of the things they'd had to give up, but in the round, it would be worth having. And whilst we did have that in the chemical context, and it was possible to make some changes to that chairman's text where there was consensus, that proved not possible in the biological sphere. Uh, the change in administrations in Washington was key. Uh, we went from a democratic president who had been strongly supportive of this. And in fact, we probably would never have got uh, the ad hoc group's mandate had there not been a democratic president sitting in the White House because the traditional US view was that verification was not possible or doable or indeed desirable. So with George W. Bush in, in the White House and people like um, John Bolton in charge in the State Department, the, the prospects of a protocol diminished somewhat substantially. And of course, the US announced very publicly, despite advice from its allies not to do it, um, they killed the protocol. And of course, that allowed everyone else to come out and say, oh, wasn't protocol wonderful? Nasty US has killed it. In fact, they're the ones who had the serious problems. And it would have been interesting to have seen what would have happened had the US held fire for a little bit and said, well, we have some issues, serious issues. Um, we can discuss them. And then how would we have ended up? My gut feeling is we probably wouldn't have got a protocol. But it was just so fraught with many genuine technical difficulties and the political obstacles uh, were just too great to, to overcome. Thank you. Uh, and still to this day, 20 years later, uh, it's the, the historical memory is 
Well, John Bolton came, and in July of 20, uh, 2001, he pulled the, the brake, and, and that was it of that. But in reality, if one looks at the number of differences, the, the number of square brackets in the document leading up uh, to, to the final days of negotiation, uh, it's quite improbable that uh, success would have been uh, had uh, at, at that time. Uh, it, it, Matthew, if I may uh, turn to this, you mentioned earlier that you wanted to share a, a, a few thoughts on, on verification. You've said elsewhere that, you know, it, it, it is possible. I mean, it is hard uh, to distinguish between uh, is it verifiable? Is it hardly verifiable, etc. Those degrees uh, are hard. But there are things that one can look at. Storage facilities, uh, aerobiology, whether there's an aerosolization uh, chambers, the, the kinds of precautions that are taken, the studies on non-endemic pathogens. Why is any uh, state studying them? Um, very large scale production units, uh, if, if they are not for vaccines, uh, trace organization and who finances, test grounds, etc. So all of these things are there. But you've pointed out to another broader aspect in this, yes, and that is openness. openness. What ultimately openness decides the success or failure of an international agreement is the point of view of the major actors in the particular government under consideration. In the case of the Chemical Weapons Treaty, if we go back to the Geneva Protocol, the chemical industry was strongly opposed to United States ratification of the Geneva Protocol. And in part that was because the chemical industry thought that perhaps if there was a future for chemical weapons, the fledgling American chemical industry would benefit and possibly not be so badly threatened by the very strong German chemical industry. The point there is that the opposition of industry is what killed the Geneva Protocol in the 1926 Senate negotiations. Now let's come up to the Chemical Weapons Convention uh, in much more recent times. The Chemical Manufacturers Association by this time was strongly in favor of helping create the Chemical Weapons Convention. There were a couple of things that determined that. First of all, in the United States, there had grown up sensitivity to industrial pollution by chemicals. For example, DuPont had a motto when I was in my teens, better things for better living through chemistry. By the time you get to the 1970s, DuPont dropped the word chemistry because it had a bad name. And their motto became better things for better living, full stop. This is very important, what I'm saying. When it came time to negotiate the Chemical Weapons Convention, Bob Mikulak, who was, in a sense, one of the heroes of this story, decided to make contact with the industry. And he contacted, I think, I don't know if he had to ask permission. I'll bet he didn't. He contacted Irving Shapiro, who was the CEO of DuPont. And that created a link between the arms control people in the United States and the highest levels of industry. And both DuPont and Monsanto actually seconded high level people, one from Leo Zeftel from DuPont and Will Carpenter from Monsanto to work full time on negotiation of the Chemical Weapons Convention, but without losing their salary. So that shows you how interested in and supportive of the CWC, the American chemical industry was. If they had opposed it, for sure, no matter what you think about the actual issues, there would be no CWC. Now let's go to the Biological Weapons Convention. We were horribly misled. There was no industry organization that represented the new biotechnology companies that were based on the discoveries in molecular biology. An upstart organization pretended to represent the industry. We didn't realize that they really had no direct communication with the CEOs of the major companies. This organization was called Pharma. And like a young organization, it struggled for existence. And its main role was to pretend to represent the industry. It did not but we all believed it did. 
And so although it's true that once you had a change of administration and John Bolton and Jesse Helms in the Senate, no matter what you did, you weren't going to. So, so what should have happened is we, that is our government, should have contacted the CEOs of the appropriate industry. I did that, but it was too late. Roy Vagelos had been the CEO of Merck, one of the biggest corporations then involved in biotechnology. And uh, I was on Cape Cod, he was on Martha's Vineyard, so we had lunch on the vineyard. And I asked him, would he oppose verification? He said, certainly not. The kind of verification that we were talking about in the protocol negotiations in Geneva. Has anyone ever approached you about this from the United States government? No. There had been no Bob Mikulak. Nobody operating at the level of the CEOs. And he explained to me why there would be no objection. He said, you must understand that there is a time in the development of a drug that's very secret. The first, of course, is when a company decides to look into the possibility. You don't want anyone knowing what you're thinking about. And he used the case of the statins that prevent the overdeposition of cholesterol in the circulatory system. He said, we decided to look to see if there was a drug that could slow down the synthesis of cholesterol in the liver. Because by that time, Bloch and the man in the Germany who shared the Nobel Prize for uh, discovering the biosynthetic pathway for cholesterol that had just been done. So they have a large collection of chemicals and they tested all of these in dogs to see what would prevent the synthesis of cholesterol. This all had to be secret because there's no patent you can take out yet. And just to even know that that uh, Merck was doing this might cause some other country, some other company, even in the United States. So they had to be kept secret. Anyway, eventually they settled on the first statin. I think it was simvastatin. But even then, they had to develop methods of producing it. And by this time, they're applying for patents. Now they have patent protection. And at least in all countries that respect the patent law, which at that time, there was a question about China, but much less a question today, do, uh, Merck would have been almost delighted to destroy a company which violated the patent law because they could take them to court and wipe them out. They felt very protected. Furthermore, the kinds of things that we wanted to do to verify the potential protocol for verification of the BWC, we didn't need to go in the laboratory where they were giving chemicals to dogs. We didn't need to go in the offices where they were reading about the biosynthesis of cholesterol. We needed to go into the factory where they make it. And those factories, Vagelos told me, were open to the public in the first place. There was nothing secret about it. And he gave a reason for this. In the chemical industry, if you can shave the price of a big industrial chemical like phosgene by even a few pennies, it makes a big difference to the customers because it's a big ticket item, save a lot of money. So if a visitor to a chemical factory could see, ah, they're using a certain temperature or a certain catalyst, and then you go home and save a few pennies off of your production of phosgene, well, even the chemical industry itself doesn't worry about that because they wanted to help the Chemical Weapons Convention. But in the biopharmaceutical industry, it's quite different. The main costs are the research, the advertising, and the packaging, not the production. Saving a penny or two off of the production cost would not give a big advantage to anybody. Besides, they're patent protected. And besides, if you had asked at least Roy Vagelos, would Merck have wanted to be seen by the public as in favor of a treaty to verify a convention against biological weapons? He would have been enthusiastic, but no one ever asked him. We were bamboozled by pharma.
<laughs> Bob Mikolek is a, is a good friend, and I've invited him to to share. He's he shared privately some of some of this. It's it's incredible how much one individual can can do. Um, uh, Sergey, I see that you you've uh, you would like to uh, to add to this. Uh, please do. Uh, yes, I think it's uh, very interesting and uh, important what uh, Matt has been saying right now. Uh, indeed, uh, we kind of, when we achieve something like the Chemical Weapons Convention, we collectively tend to forget um, even the positive lessons that we could have drawn. For example, the Chemical Weapons Convention, which, 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 which means that one of the problems in arms control and disarmament is that we continue to work in silos. Those who work in the nuclear area don't know what's happening elsewhere. Those who work with the chemical weapons don't know, don't really know, they could have heard, what's happening in the bio area and, and vice versa. So, uh, in chemical weapons, we had uh, several very serious attempts to uh, increase confidence and uh, build better dialogue. Uh, well, very often, by the way, from the, uh, it, those were UK initiatives, uh, like uh, trial challenge inspections and uh, all, all those thinking that went into, into challenge inspections, which which I can say were very useful, let's say, for uh, us in Moscow to sell the whole thing to the military, uh, etc. complex. Um, on industry, we were having uh, several meetings uh, with the industry at the initiative of, uh, of different countries, I specifically remember Sweden, uh, but also uh, if you take what uh, the chemical, the final chemical weapons convention says about uh, inspections in industry uh, and inspections uh, specifically in facilities dealing with uh, Schedule One chemicals, the most, let's say, toxic, dangerous things. Um, of course, there are limitations, like a single small scale facility with one ton limit. Th th that uh, should be inspected. Then uh, another one facility per country uh, with a maximum of 10 kilos, uh, specifically devoted to protective uh, purposes, that is also subject to inspections. But then you have different, uh, much smaller laboratories, uh, which have to be approved by uh, the government of this or that country. And then unspecified number of even smaller laboratories, which may synthesize uh, those Schedule One chemicals, which even do not need to be approved by the uh, relevant government. So it's, it's, it's kind of unlimited. Uh, and we don't know now uh, how many such laboratories are in any given country which can still legitimately produce, uh, well, not produce, the better word is synthesize, uh, those Schedule One chemicals. This was the end of part one of our conversation. Please consider subscribing to the Diplomacy Light channel to be the first to know when the next episode and others like it are uploaded.